Welcome back. It's been a while, to, but we're going to be doing a courageous man or foolish one. Lazarus and the rich man. Okay. Basically, we're going to be carry, uh, we're going to be trying to instruction righteousness and encouragement to the brethren. But this one's going to be a little bit of a focus also on lost people. If you're watching this and you're lost, I pray you make it through the whole video. Okay. Life of a Christian versus the life of a lost man. Someone who chooses the world over Jesus Christ. So, Luke 16, verse 19. We're going to turn to Luke 16, verse 19. I'm sorry about the distraction. A couple hummingbirds are duking it out over there. Luke 16, 19. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuous, sumptuously, if I can pronounce it right, every day. Okay, I look up the word sumptuously, expensively, splendidly, with great magnificence. In other words, his li daily living, he spent a lot of money, of course, which is why it calls him a rich man. But also there's here where it's splendidly and great magnificence. And the reason I want to point that out is, is people who are high up in, in society do that. Who do we see that does that today? Uh, you've got all these famous actors, singers. Uh, world leaders, okay, you even see so-called pastors in Babel buildings doing that too, okay, they got expensive suits, there was a video I watched once um, where someone was a guest and got up to uh, do a teaching on tithing, and uh, the pastor that was introducing him was, and normally I don't judge on this, but he's looked like he, how do I say this, he had an expensive suit, he had rings on that sparkled, and he looked well fed. I guess it's the best way to say it, okay? Basically, he looked sumptuous, expensively, splendidly, and with great magnificence. Look at me. Um, and it doesn't necessarily mean you need a suit and tie to do that, because the lost world, like I said, uh, you have um, singers dressing worldly to please the people and to put on a show, look at me. They're always trying to put, push new things and new styles to say, hey, look at me. Uh, actors, you know, people in government, just famous people. Uh, okay. So the reason I wanted to put this out there is this, Revelation Chapter 17, verse 4. Remember it said he was clothed in purple and fine linen. Okay? It's a rich man. He's clothed in purple and fine linen. Revelation 17, 4. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. This is talking about the Catholic Church. And I know if you're lost in watching this, you don't quite understand yet. We're going to get into it. But bottom line, you're going to have all these false religions hammering at you saying, we're right, we're right. Okay, you have the rich man who's clothed in purple. You have the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet. The Catholic Church does purple and scarlet. Why? Because they're worldly. They've chosen this world. They've chosen their flesh. Now, Revelation 18:16. And saying, Alas, alas, that great city that was clothed in fine linen and purple, and scarlet, and decked with gold, and precious stones and pearls. For in one hour so great riches has come to naught. And as we read this story, anything you try to accumulate or store up here on earth in this life will come to naught. And every shipmaster and all the company and ships and sailors and as many as trade by sea stood afar off. Okay. Being rich in this life, you can't take it with you. And we're going to get into what it kind of takes to be rich in this life. But another way to look at the purple here and the fine linen. Purple, John, uh, John 19.1 Then Pilate therefore took Jesus and scourged him. And the soldiers plaited a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they put on him a purple robe. This is Jesus Christ, the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who is God the Father, manifest in the flesh. Put on a purple robe and said, Hail, King of the Jews! And they smote him with their hands. We're going to stop there for a second. 
Hail, King of the Jews, they had to put, on, put a purple robe on him. That's why I think there's a little bit more to this rich man than just him being rich, okay? Because the color was purple. He was someone important. Okay? But if you notice his whole story, he wasn't important enough for, for, for his name to be mentioned. Okay? Lazarus was the important one, and his name is mentioned. For Pilate therefore went forth again and saith unto them, Behold, I bring him forth to you, that ye may know that I find no fault in him. Then came Jesus forth, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate saith unto them, Behold the man. They put a purple robe on Jesus to mock him. If you ever read what actually happens to Jesus Christ, I learn more and more every day. Did you know brothers and sisters in Christ, and if you're lost out there, do you really know what Jesus went through? He had flesh ripped off of him to the point that there was bones showing. His beard was ripped out. He was beaten beyond recognition, spit upon. He was mocked. He was nailed to a cross. Every ounce of his blood was spilled to pay the price that you and I are supposed to pay, pay, brothers and sisters in Christ. He paid it. And if you're lost out there, you need to go to the cross, and Jesus will pay for your sins as well. Jesus went through, I hate to say it like this, but hell. But it's not the hell that the Bible describes. But basically, he went through and paid a price that you and I could never pay. Okay. Let's look at the fine linen side with Jesus Christ. John 19.23, Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts. To every soldier a part, and also his coat. Remember the coat that they put on him? that was purple. Now the coat was without seam, woven from the top throughout. They said therefore among themselves, Let us not rend it, but cast lots for it. Whose it shall be, that the scriptures might be fulfilled, which saith, They parted my raiment among them, and from my vesture they did cast lots. These things, therefore, the soldiers did. Okay. Uh, fine linen. The way his the coat was made, there was no seam. If they ripped it, it would have destroyed it. They couldn't use it in anything else. But if you actually follow the story of Jesus Christ, he was born of a virgin... He grew up, and at, he was a carpenter's son. He was a carpenter, and he was poor. And at 33, he started his ministry. He was perfect. There's just no other way to say it. He is perfect in every way. He was the perfect sacrifice to pay for your sins. He paid for mine. Brothers and sisters in Christ out there saved, he's paid for yours, and you can attest to that. All right. You've got to come to the point where you come to the end of your self-righteousness and pride and say, I'm no good. Jesus was perfect. I am just a mess, a complete mess. Did Jesus conform to this world and bow down to traditions of men? Did he give in? No, he didn't. He stood by God's word, and he did right. He was perfect. 1 Timothy 6.10 So here's the biggest thing that we see here with this rich man, which his the description pretty much explains it. For the love of money is the root of all evil, as some have coveted after. They have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Okay? All the money in this world is not worth you not losing your own soul and going to hell. Um, if they should gain the whole world and lose their own soul, or what's out profit a man, okay? it's not worth it. Nothing on this earth, physical possessions, is worth going to hell and then tossed into the lake of fire to burn for all eternity. It's not worth it. Okay? The love of money is the root of all evil. Notice it says, the love of money. Can you have money? Yes. Today, I think that you really, really have to compromise to be rich. But can you have money? Yes. This is saying the love of money, and to have the love of money, what does that mean? You have to compromise. 
If you have such a love of money and you want money, money, you want a big home, you want four, like two to three, four, five cars, and you just want to have all this wealth, you got to compromise to do it today. There's no way you can be a millionaire today and not compromise. There's no way. But let's look at what happens to the rich man and let's look what happens. We're going to get into Lazarus now. First we're going to describe Lazarus. Luke 16, 20, and there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores and desired to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. He was a beggar. Right? He was poor. And he lived off the crumbs of the rich man. Easy versus hard. If you take a look at this example, this contrast with, from a rich, rich man, if I can say it right, rich man that's worldly, who fares sumptuously, puts on this big show, lives exuberant, and then you have a man who's poor, sits on the streets, he's got sores, dogs are licking his sores, and he basically takes the crumbs from the master's table, in other words, he takes the scraps, don't, anything that someone will throw him, in this case, he's talking about the rich man. Whatever the rich man would throw him, probably mocked him and laughed at him, and just threw it. Here you go. You're pathetic. Look at me. I'm great. I've gained the whole world, and I'm great. Look at me. I'm important. Look at that guy. Yeah. Here's a roll eight, a fourth of, of the. Yeah. You know. It's just that's the contrast we have: an easy life versus a hard life. And when you get saved, if you're lost and you get saved, I'm not going to lie to you and say your life is going to be great. Okay? Life as a Christian today is so hard. Okay? And I'm not trying to discourage anybody. Those who are truly saved know what I'm talking about. But God will give you peace, brothers and sisters in Christ. God will give you joy here and there, brothers and sisters in Christ. But our flesh, battling our flesh, being vexed by this lost world, and this lost world also tempting us, and Satan and his evil spirits always trying to come in every so often and trying to destroy a home, destroy a marriage, destroy a family, destroy a ministry. It's a constant battle, a constant warfare that we go through. Okay, 1 John 2, 15. Love not the world. We're going back to the lost people out there. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. One of the big things that keep people from getting saved, that keep you from getting saved out there if you're lost, is the world, the love of the world. You love your sin, you love your flesh, the world is wicked, and you love that. You don't want to give that up. Now there's false teachings that are going around telling you that all you have to do is believe in Jesus and you can have the world. Uh, that's not what the Bible teaches. The true gospel is repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Confess both in prayer and call upon the name of the Lord to save you. And afterwards, when God saves you, you are now a bondservant to Jesus Christ. He owns you. And He's going to make changes in your life. Spiritual sacrifices. Over time, God's going to clean up your life and you're going to be separated from the world. Love not the world. The Bible says that we are in the world, but we are not of the world. When you get saved, we are separate. Okay. James 4.4 4. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Okay. I'll be doing a teaching on just that verse here shortly. But what that's talking about, yeah, the lost world shouldn't be looking at you saying, yeah, you're great, you're amazing, you're awesome. But the main point of that verse is reconciling. You can either be reconciled to God the Father through Jesus Christ and live with Him for all eternity in heaven, or you can be reconciled to this world and spend an eternity in hell with Satan. Those are your only two options. Okay? The rich man, reconciling to the world. The world's got to love me. It's about what the world thinks, what the world wants, and I'm popular and it feels good. The whole thing about if it feels good, do it. 
your flesh being in charge, you're trying to reconcile to the world. When it says you're not to be a friend of the world, it's talking about how you're supposed to be reconciled through Jesus Christ, your creator. God, through Jesus Christ. That's the main point of that verse. You're not supposed to be reconciling yourself to the world. You're not to care what the world thinks. Okay? You're to care what God thinks. Now, I don't want to jump ahead of myself, but we're going to be talking about this. Luke 16, 22, back to Lazarus and the rich man. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell, this is the rich man, in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torment, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. Abraham's bosom was a place that the Old Testament saints went to before they went to heaven. Jesus went down, got him, and took him to heaven after he died and resurrected. Okay. Now, Abraham's bosom's up here, and I believe hell was down lower than Abraham's bosom. And Lazarus is having to look up his head in a great gulf, as we get to see here, he's looking straight ahead, but he's looking up. It says he lifted up his eyes. Lift eyes be in torment, and see if Abraham fought Lazarus in his bosom. Did you know, brothers and sisters, that Jesus preached more on hell and damnation than anyone else in the Bible? If you're lost out there, hell is a real place. It's a literal place of burning where people are going to go to spend eternity. Now, are there different levels of hell? I thought I'd throw in a few verses here real quick. For a fire is kindled in mine anger, and shall burn unto the lowest hell, and shall consume the earth with her increase, and set on fire the foundations of the mountains. Okay, lowest hell there. In other words, insinuating that there's more than one level of hell. Or it could just be saying that where hell is, lowest part of the earth. Psalms 86.13, For great is thy mercy towards me, and thou hast delivered my soul from the lowest hell. Like I said, once again, it could be just describing where hell is, or that there's different levels of hell. There's some teachings on different levels of hell. Um, you can't be 100%. This is guaranteed that there's different levels of hell. But at least lets us know where hell is in the earth. The lowest hells. Okay. Matthew 7.13 Brothers and sisters in Christ, we can testify to the lost world, and the lost world, um, ye do know this, okay? Enter ye, in the, enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go thereat. You want this world? You want to be reconciled to this world? Then you're going to wind up in hell. If you're going to love this world and choose your flesh and your sin over Jesus Christ, you're going to wind up in hell. That's the easy path. 14. Because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth in, unto life, and few there be that find it. If you're truly seeking God, you will find Him. And that's the hardest thing about preaching the gospel today, brothers and sisters in Christ. And it's the hardest thing for receiving the gospel to the lost people out there. You've got to be seeking God. If, you're not seek if they're not seeking God, they're not going to listen. You can plant a seed so when the time comes and they are seeking God, they'll remember, hey, this one guy told me such and such. Now, is loving the world and being a friend to the world worth going to hell for all eternity? Is your sin and a good time forever how short it is we're on earth compared to eternity, 80 years, 40 years. If you live by the flesh, you shall die. So most people that are out there and living it up, they don't really live that long. Is it worth an eternity in hell? Something to think about if you're lost. Uh, if you're saved, you understand that we had to come to that point and say, is it worth it? Is this world worth it? Is our flesh worth it? Is our sin worth it? Luke 16, 24. Let's see what the rich man's person who chose the world over doing what's right. Let's see what happened to him and his attitude. We know he went to hell. Let's see what his attitude is. 
And he cried, remember the word cried, and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his fingers in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. There's two things we need to realize there. First, he cried. Matthew 25, 41. Um, then, uh, tormented in this flame. Let's do that one quick. Tormented in this flame. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye accursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Do you realize that hell was not created for you and me? Hell was created for the devil and his angels. Okay? And to prove that also, the Bible says, 2 Peter 3, nine, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering towards us, us word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God didn't create hell for you and me. He created it for the devil and the fallen angels. The devil and his angels, in other words, demons. Devils. Okay? You don't have to go to hell. God doesn't want you to go to hell. I've said this tons of times. Saved sinners don't want you to go to hell. Okay? And as we're going to find out in this story, people in hell, like your family members that went to hell, friends, uh, people in hell, period, don't want you in hell. Okay? Matthew 13, 41. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. I chose this verse to let you know the rich man cried out. Okay. What happens when you go to hell? There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. You're going to be screaming. You're going to be grinding your teeth because of all the pain and suffering that you're going to have to face for all eternity. Hell is everlasting. Hell gets tossed into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is everlasting. Revelations 24. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Is this world worth it? It goes back to that question I asked. Okay, Is loving the world and being a friend of the world worth going to hell and then tossing the lake of fire for all eternity? Is your sin, your flesh, those good times, those great times, is it worth an eternity in hell? Something to really think about. Luke 16.25 but Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receiveth the good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now is he comforted, and thou art tormented. Notice it said, likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And besides all this, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Okay. The worst thing that can ever happen to a man, the worst thing that can ever happen to a man, mankind, is right there. Everlasting separation from God and Jesus Christ, your Creator. It's the worst thing that can ever happen to you. You go to hell, you're going to be separated from God for all eternity. 2 Corinthians 11, 23. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. This is a man called Paul, you find him in the Bible, and he was killing Christians, he was doing evil and wickedness, and God gave him a chance to repent, and he did. He repented, he believed in Jesus Christ, and after he got saved, he started preaching the gospel. He had a changed life, he turned his back on this world, he turned his back on the traditions of men. He started fighting his flesh. You want to know the life that he lived? This goes back to me not lying to you. I have brothers and sisters in, out, in Christ out there that will attest to this. Okay? You get saved, you're going to have a changed life. You're going to have to turn your back on this world after you, God saves you. He will help you to have the strength. You already have the will. If you get saved, you don't want to be part of this world. Okay? 2 Corinthians 11, 12, or 11 verse 23 um, I'll start all over. And they minister, and they ministers of, 
are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. In laborings more abundant, in stripes above measures, he was beaten. In prisons more frequent, thrown in prison a lot. In deaths off, deaths oft. Of the Jew five times received I forty stripes save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods. Once was I stoned. Having, what stone means is they have you stand there and people take and pick up rocks and just throw them at you until you're dead. Everybody just keeps throwing rocks at you. Okay. Thrice I suffered shipwreck on a ship and, he, and they crashed. Night and day I have been in the depth, in the deep, and journeys often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils by mine own countrymen, his own people turned against him. If you get saved, I'm not going to lie to you, you're going to have family members turn against you, you're going to lose fr all your friends. I almost want to say all your friends. If you truly stand for the word of God and have a zero tolerance for sin, uh, and it's a, your life is, it's like a sanctification, it's going to take a while, but over time, um, was it three years, it just felt like after being saved and me fighting the Lord and the Lord bringing me to my knees saying, you need to give this up, you need to give that up, after three years of that, I started feeling alone. I lost my friends. I had family members that uh, some of them turned against me. Some were just like, oh, he, he's just over there doing his own thing, you know. They don't really want to be around me as much because I no longer indulge in the world. I gave up movies. I had family members I'd go to movies with a lot, and that was almost like our number one thing to do together. And I said, I don't do movies anymore. Well, there went that relationship. Because I chose Jesus Christ. Okay? You're going to have people turn against you. The lost world is going to look at you differently. They're supposed to see a difference in you. It goes back to not loving the world and not being a friend of the world. If you love the world and you're a friend of the world and trying to re reconcile to the world, the world's going to treat you like you're one of them. And that's not what they're supposed to do. So brothers and sisters in Christ, if that's the case, Maybe you're newly saved, maybe you're really struggling, but you need to get to the point where the world sees a difference in you. Okay, okay in perils by the heathen, that's the thing about, we just talked about how the lost world's going to look at you. In perils in the city, um, I don't have my King James Bible sweater anymore, but when I did, I'd walk into town and people give me weird looks. And every once in a while, it was an opening for me to preach the gospel to somebody. Oh, you're a King James Bible believer? And I said, yes. I was able to preach... Uh, the Bible version issue to people because of the shirt. But when you go into the cities and you stand for truth, I don't, I don't dress worldly. I, I'm not, you know, doing the things that the world does, acting like the world, you know, doing things, you know, joking the way the world does. Uh, they're not going to look at you the same way. Okay, you're going to be in perils. Uh, California, I think there's, they, it, it didn't go through, but they're trying to ban the Bible from California. Uh, there's places in the world where you get killed as a Christian. You go into a city and you say, I'm a Christian, you get killed. You try preaching the gospel, they'll kill you. Okay? In perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren. A lot of false people. I think that's the biggest perils that we're facing today, brothers and sisters in Christ. And a lot of lost people out there, if you're still watching it, you've been probably told so many different stories of gospels and what's right and what Christians are and you're so confused because there's a lot of fake Christians out there they're fakes and they're feeding you full of lies because they were fed full of lies you want the truth get a King James Bible and read about Jesus Christ Matthew Mark Luke and John read about Jesus Christ okay. the Old Testament the Ten Commandments read how we're sinners we can't keep the law there's nothing you can do. You can't earn heaven. Okay. I understand the tough, how tough it is out there today. It's very tough because of false brethren. Okay, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and in and thirst. Remember Lazarus, how he hungered and thirst. In weariness and painfulness, how the dogs looked at his sores because he chose not. To conform to the world. People say, well, you're adding to that. Uh, it said the evil that was brought upon him. And we read the Bible and you know that if you love the world, if you conform to the world, 
Uh, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Brothers and sisters of Christ, we're not to conform to the world. You're not to go back to the world after God has called you out of it. Okay. He went through pain, uh, physical pain, uh, hunger. Okay. Like I said, in order to be rich, rich, I'm not saying you're going to have to be on the streets in an in a old jacket that has holes in it and stuff and be poor, but I'm just saying... In order to be rich, like the rich man, you have to be worldly. You have to give in to the world. You've got to reconcile to the world. The world's got to love you. You've got to compromise. Do things that the Bible calls a sin, and oftentimes an abomination, complete abomination. Okay. Fasting's often in cold and nakedness. Besides those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. When you get saved... There's going to be a changed life. God's going to start cleaning up your life. And that's a good thing. It's a good thing. We have a tough life as a Christian, but I've had more peace and more joy after God saved me than I ever did before I got saved. I, had, I was feeding my flesh, and my flesh was getting all riled up, and it was deceiving you because you're having such a good time. It wasn't peace. When I found out what true peace is, I didn't have it. I didn't have peace in my lost life. Um, I didn't have true joy in my lost life. I was running 90 miles an hour, and the moment you come to a stop, when you think you have peace and joy, and it's really the flesh that you're feeding, when you come to a stop, that's when the sorrow sinks in. That's when the fear, that's when everything just feels horrible. So what do you do? You get to go in 90 miles an hour again. Let me go throw a game in. Let me watch a movie, TV shows, go out to eat, parties, bars, whatever. Okay? Porn. You know, drugs. Whatever. And now you're going back 90 miles an hour and everything feels good again. You think you have peace and joy. You don't have no clue what pe true peace and true joy is until you get saved. Luke 16, 27. This is the rich man. Remember we talked about how people in hell don't want you in hell. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldst send him to my father's house, for I have five brethren. The rich man is asking Abraham to send Lazarus, like resurrect Lazarus, send him to my, my family. I'm in hell. Hell is real. I'm burning. I'm dying of thirst, I'm wailing, I'm gnashing my teeth. This is a real place, and I, I'm going to be stuck here for all eternity. And all of that, he's still in his right mind. That's the, that, should, that should scare you big time. Brothers and sisters in Christ, that should scare the lost world. If you're lost, that should scare you, the fact that he's still in his right mind. He's going through so much agony and pain, and yet his mind is sharp as a tack. And he's saying, I don't want my family members coming here. I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, Neither will they be persuaded, the one rose from the dead. Okay? This life, God's going to send a lot of people your way. But bottom line, if you're lost and you're truly seeking God, you will find Him. Someone once said, and my wife tells me this, and I can't remember if it's a closet or a box, but either way, if you were locked in a closet or locked in a box, if you're truly seeking Jesus Christ and God, you'll find Him. There is no, all oh, some backwater country, someone off somewhere like that. What if they've never heard of Jesus? If they're truly seeking God, they will find Him. And it's been proven in a lot of other stories where they went back in and these people were like, they were worshiping a God that they didn't truly know and they were able to preach Jesus to them and they're like, yeah, that sounds right. Because they truly were seeking God. Okay? Jeremiah 29, 13. And ye shall seek me and find me, 
when ye shall search for me with all your heart. I got to a point in my life where I started seeking God with all my heart. I wasn't just sitting there mocking God. I wasn't sitting there anymore just saying, Lord, why don't you save me? Or, Lord, I believe in you. That means you have to save me. And No. I had to be truly seeking God with all my heart. And when you truly repent, godly sorrow worketh repentance unto salvation. Not to be repented of, but the sorrows of the world worketh death. When you truly have godly sorrow, that means you're sorry. You say, Lord, I'm sorry for sinning against you. Okay? And that happens in the heart. You're seeking God with all your heart. Lord, I'm a sinner. I'm a dirty, rotten, filthy, low-down, no-good sinner on my way to hell. Hell is a real place. I'm on my way to hell. Okay. And what is worldly sorrow? Is loving the world... I go back to this. Is loving the world and being a friend of the world worth going to hell? That's worldly sorrow. I really... I really have to have, have a changed life. I really have to be sorry. I don't want to give up this sin. I don't want to give up this world. I love this world. I love everything about this world. I love all the wickedness and sin. You start to see when you get saved, when you get to that point of seeking God with all your heart, you get to that point where you start seeing how wicked you are. How sinful and wicked you are. How bad your life is. And you come to God saying, I don't want this. I want better. I want something better. I don't want this evil, wicked life. God changes your life. Godly sorrow is having being sorry in your heart for sinning against God. You've done something to upset an almighty, righteous God that's going to judge you one day. Your Creator. That's true godly sorrow. That's true biblical repentance, which you've got to go through. But the sorrows of the world work at death. If you're so sorry you will not let go of this world, you're going to wind up in hell. And I'm not talking about you cleaning up your life. I'm talking about your heart. This world is more important than Jesus Christ. This world is more important than repenting and believing in Jesus Christ. And here, money is more important. My flesh is more important. Movies, TV shows, video games. Drugs. I can go through all this stuff that keep people, they, they love it and they don't want to give it up. And they know that in their head, they know that getting saved means God's going to clean up my life. And He will clean up your life after He saves you. You need to come to God as you are, as a sinner, and have a sorrow for sinning against God. But notice it says here, um, uh, search for me with all your heart. You're to seek God. It's not cleaning up your life. That's called seeking God. If you're truly seeking God, you will find Him. But it requires you to drop your self-righteousness and pride in coming to Him as a sinner, realizing you're no good. Okay. Proverbs 8.17 I love them that love me, and those that seek me early shall find me. I know this is Old Testament. But it's talking about if you seek God, you will find Him. Acts 17, 27, That they should seek the Lord, if happily they might feel after Him and find Him, though He be not far from every one of us. I don't know if you've ever heard that thing about Jesus knocking at your door. Jesus is the door. He knocks at the door. You're the one that's got to knock at the door, and Jesus will open it. Jesus is the door. Romans 1.20 For the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. There's plenty of evidence all around you that God exists. The number one example and evidence that God exists, right here, you have a body, you have a soul, and you have a spirit. We were created in, God, in the likeness of God. Body, soul, and spirit. We are the number one evidence that God exists. You look around at everything that's created. This didn't happen by accident. All this evidence is around you. God gave you a conscience. You can sear your conscience. You can... What is it... Uh, 
there's a lot of things I have a teaching on conscience, but bottom line, you can mess up your conscience to a point where you don't, you're, all the wicked sin that you're into, you don't see anything wrong with it. But God gave you a conscience, okay? You are without excuse. If you die because you reject Jesus Christ after everything we talked about, the rich man is in hell because he chose the world, and Lazarus chose to be separate from the world. The evil that was done to Lazarus because he's like, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do what it takes to be like that rich man. If you die in your sins and go to hell, you deserve to be there. I deserve to be there, but Jesus Christ paid the price for me, so I don't have to go to hell. I, I deserve to go there, but it's only by the grace of God that I'm not going there. Anybody that winds up in hell deserves to be there. 100%. No excuse. They are without excuse. Matthew 7, 7. Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. I have a gospel message on this channel. I pray that you go and watch it. A much needed message. Jesus does not want you to go to hell. That's why he died on the cross. God manifest in the flesh. He made a way for you to go to heaven. He doesn't want you to go to hell. I don't want you to go to hell. My brothers and sisters in Christ out there watching this video don't want you to go to hell. You need to repent. You need to fall on your knees right here, right now. Wherever you are out there, you need to fall on your knees and you need to repent. You need to realize that you are a sinner on your way to hell. And I just told you what the cost is for choosing the world over Jesus Christ. What the cost is of choosing your sin and your flesh over Jesus Christ. Hell's a real place. That sorrow for sinning against God and that fear of hell needs to be there. You need to fall on your knees and repent. You need to believe in who Jesus is and what he did for you. Jesus died on the cross. And I'm going to go through it again. His beard was ripped out for you. He was beaten beyond recognition. You couldn't even look at the man and say, wait a minute, is that Jesus? I, I don't know, is that Jesus? He was beaten beyond recognition. He was whipped so much that flesh was ripped out and bones were showing. He was spit upon. He was ridiculed. And one of the things I'm learning, and he was, what's it, um, he was nailed to the cross naked. You want to talk about shame. All this blood from all the pain, the whipping and everything, all this blood, almost every, if not every ounce of his blood was spilled to pay the price that you are supposed to pay, which is hell. And if you reject going to Jesus Christ and believing in Him, that He died and rose again the third day, proving that He is God, you're going to wind up in hell. Repent and believe. And if you're on your knees and you've repented and you've believed, then you need to say a prayer to the Lord. You need to talk to Him. That's what prayer is. It's just talking to the Lord. A lot of people try to make it out of something ceremonial or anything. All prayer is is you one-on-one -on -one with the Lord talking with the Lord. That's what prayer is. So while you're there on your knees, you need to be praying to the Lord. Confess that you're a sinner on your way to hell and that you deserve to go to hell. Confess that you believe that Jesus can save you, that God can save you through Jesus Christ, that His blood is God's blood, and that He died for your sins. Then you ask God to save you. And if all that's coming from here, if it's coming from your heart, God will save you. He saved me. I'm the chiefest of sinners. I'm a dirty, rotten, filthy, low-down, no-good, worthless man. Yet God saved me. If God could save me, you saw, we talked about Paul briefly when I mentioned that he killed Christians. He killed people. He was doing all kinds of wickedness. And yet God saved him. God can save him, he can save you. The Bible here talks about people in all kinds of sin where God saved them. If you're breathing, God can save you. 
Repent, believe, confess both in prayer. Just talk to the Lord like I'm talking to you. Let Him know that you're sorry for sinning against Him. Let Him know that you believe in Jesus Christ what he did for you at the cross, that he rose the third day late, three days later, proving that he's God. And ask God, say, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. Lord, save me. And if it's heartfelt and it's happening here, he will save you. The world is not worth it. Courageous man or foolish man? The rich man was the biggest fool ever. Lazarus was the courageous one. Be courageous. Choose Jesus Christ. True, choose the life of a Christian. Don't be foolish. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.